Good morning or good afternoon. Hey guys and welcome to another lesson. We are on topic 6.5, the nervous system. We only have one more uh, small brief little thing to go over in this topic and then we will be heading on to our final project. So wow, we have reached the end of the biology IB curriculum, which is amazing uh, here on the 12th of May. And um, I really look forward to getting into those projects and uh, yeah, just enjoying the rest of the year. So let's go ahead and dive right in the nervous system. So today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the actual structure of our neurons, how they work, how signals are uh, sent along them, um, and um, some different neurotransmitters that they use and different conditions that might affect them. We're going to start off with the idea that your nervous system is basically like the electrical system of your body. It decides uh, how signals are sent rapidly throughout your body, and these are, of course, going to be electrical um, in opposition to the chemical signals that are sent through your circulatory system. Um, and these signals are going to be fast operating signals that are basically going to help you maintain homeostasis like the rest of the systems in your body. So this can be divided into two main parts. You have your central nervous system, which I'm sure you guys have heard of a million times. Your central nervous system is a favorite topic of sci-fi novels and shows and television uh, and movies where they're like, aha, it has affected his central nervous system. And you're like, ah, it's the brain and the spinal cord, the part that aliens like to eat. And then there's the peripheral nervous system. Uh, and if we're thinking about this in terms of our circulatory system, and you might you might have realized with both the circulatory system and your, your uh, gas exchange system and all that stuff, that we, we have large conducting vessels and we have small conducting vessels. So in your, in your uh, blood system, your circulatory system, we were talking about large vessels like arteries and veins. And then we have smaller vessels like capillaries and we were talking about your gas exchange system. You know, we had the, um, the, the big, uh, you know, bronchial tubes and then the bronchioles and uh, the smaller alveoli and all that stuff. So, so those are all good examples of what's happening here. Your CNS is basically those large centralized systems for your nerves. And then your PNS is going to link that large central system to all of your uh, systems that are attached to it, such as your musculature and you know what allows you to waggle your fingers and, and your toes and all that sort of stuff. So basically we have a hub that everything comes off of. And that little, uh, those smaller networks that go all throughout your body and control your appendages and stuff, those, that's your peripheral nervous system. All of your nervous system is composed of neurons, but not all neurons are made equal. So we're gonna look at various different versions of neurons and neural cells. However, they all do conduct electrical impulses to some degree. We're gonna look at some neurons whose job is more metabolic than uh, communicative, but most of them will conduct electrical impulses. So here's some more exacting divisions. You have either your central or peripheral nervous system, which I've already talked about. And then you're gonna have your motor, which is your efferent division or your sensory and afferent division. The only real difference here is in talking about which direction the signals are heading in. With your motor or efferent division, you're gonna send signals from your CNS to the rest of your body. So essentially, this is gonna be the system that's gonna take the signals that are coming from your brain and spinal cord and send them out to your body, such as when you wanna move your hand. You know, you're gonna send a signal from your brain to your hand that your hand is gonna move. If you consciously want to do so. So like um, if I'm picking up this coffee mug right here, I just did that because I was thinking about it and wanted to do it. That was a motor or efferent division. Now notice the E here. E, uh, I always like to think as an E for exit, so going out, right? Your sensory or afferent division is when signals are going to come in uh, from your efferent system, your peripheral or your, uh, your, you know, your appendages to your main computer or your CNS. So for example, let's say I reached out for my coffee mug and I grabbed it and my knuckles touched the actual mug itself, not just the handle, and there was scalding hot coffee in there. And I go, oh, and I let go really quick, right? And so that I did that because signals were being sent from my knuckles uh, as they picked up the heat of the coffee mug up to my brain and saying, yo, move your hand. Uh, and so that is sensory or afferent division uh, in a meaning in. I usually also think of this as inter versus intra, inter between or out, intra in. Anyway, interesting ways to remember sensory is coming to your brain from your body, motor is going from your brain to your body. Uh, 
Then we have somatic nervous system and the autonomic system. So somatic is going to control voluntary responses. So when I reached out to grab my coffee mug, that was a voluntary response. I chose to do that through my motor or efferent division. My autonomic nervous system is my involuntary responses. So when I felt the heat from the coffee mug, it immediately dropped the mug and jerked my hand away without even having to think about it. That is an example of an autonomic nervous response. Other examples of autonomic nervous response would be like your breathing. Hopefully you, I mean, now you can stop it. You can stop your breathing, but if you pass out, you start immediately breathing again. Uh, your heart beating and stuff, you might be able to control the rate. But you can't control the fact that your heart beats at all, and that is your autonomic nervous system. Then you have your sympathetic division. So these are going to be when you're in great danger and you start releasing hormones like adrenaline to deal with the situation that's going to be fight or flight. Your parasympathetic is when you're resting and not having to worry about that. So this is when you are kind of recouping, metabolizing, breaking down molecules, rebuilding systems, cleaning out your systems, or sleeping. So your parasympathetic sympathetic division. So let's take a look at a model of how this works. Okay, you're first going to have a stimulus from the environment, and I like to use heat, but in this case, it seems as if the stimulus is a glass of water. Okay, so let's say that you're thirsty. There's a glass of water sitting there on the table. This is going to be converted into electrical signers, signals by receptors in your eyes. Okay, so your eyes are going to look at the glass of water. The light that is bouncing off the glass of water is going to go into your eyes. It's going to go through your synaptic nerve, your sensory system. It's going to be interpreted by your brain as a glass of water. So in the CNS, it's going to say, ah, there's a glass of water. Uh, I'm thirsty, as a matter of fact. And so your brain is then going to send a signal through your motor or efferent um, neurons and these are going to go out to your musculature to have you reach out, grab the uh, cup of water, drink, and then set it back down. Okay, so in other words, we have taken an external stimulus, converted it to electrical signals, and then those electrical signals were converted into a physical response. And that's typically the uh, what we call sort of the central dogma of how this works, right? So stimulus response model, it's just like DNA to RNA to protein, stimulus to signal to response. So let's talk a little bit about how neurons work and what they are. There are three main general classes of neurons, which are going to be, again, cells that are specialized to send electrical signals. Your sensory neurons are going to conduct impulses to your CNS. So this would be your afferent pathway. Stuff is going from your hands uh, to your brain to relay information about how cold or hot the coffee mug is. That's a sensory neuron. And it makes sense because when you're interacting, <laughs> it makes sense. Just caught that. When you're interacting with the environment, right, uh, your senses, your taste, touch, sound, smell, all that stuff is going to be picking up information from the environment. And uh, that information is going to have to be sent back to your brain in order to be interpreted because signals aren't just, signals don't have meaning in and of themselves. You receive them all the time, but you're not going to know what they mean or what they should mean until your brain sends them, uh, until your brain receives them and interprets them. So your sensory is going to go from your senses to your brain so your brain can kind of process what you have just sensed. Your motor neurons are going to be your response neurons through your efferent pathway. So they're going to be the neurons that you activate or that your brain activates after you have received information from your sensory neurons. Then you can go ahead and send it to your motor to go ahead and relay a response. Relay neurons are very interesting. They're actually just going to be um, sending signals within your brain. So I want you to think about this. Your brain is a very complex and compartmentalized organ. Your brain uh, does, you know, not all sections of your brain do the same thing. Your cortex, your prefrontal cortex are going to be uh, working in your executive decisions. Whereas your occipital lobe, which is in the very back of your head, is going to be uh, interpreting what you see, your vision, your sight. And of course, you know, that makes sense if you guys have ever hit the back of your head really hard or been hit in the back of the head really hard. Your vision can do weird things, and that's because that's the part of your brain that controls your vision. Right? And so different parts of your brain are compartmentalized for different things. Okay, when you have a sensory neuron sending information up to your brain, it just doesn't send it anywhere. It sends it up to your brain through a very specific pathway. Sometimes that pathway has to be sent to your brain and then sent to other sections of your brain to ensure an appropriate response or formatting of the data. You can think of it this way. If you uh, have some sort of form that you have to fill for the DMV, let's say you need, um, let's say that you need a, a license plate for a trailer you just bought to attach to your car or your truck to haul something, right? Maybe the new washing machine you just got. 
Okay, so you go down to the DMV, you take the form down to the DMV, and you take it to the DMV. Now, can you just leave the form in the DMV, just open the door and drop it in there and be like, God, I got it. No. You have to go in there, you have to wait through the whole system, they call your name, you bring it up, you hand it to somebody, and more often than not, that person is going to hand it to somebody else, and you're going to kind of watch the bureaucratic process in, in, in operation. It's essentially handing it off from one part or section to the other. So when you receive a signal through your sensory neuron, it's going to go up to your brain, it's going to sit in that one section, and then it's going to be passed along to the appropriate sections in your brain using relay neurons. So we've covered the three types of neurons. But now let's go ahead and take a look at uh, their general structure to understand how they work. So when we look at a motor neuron, we're going to see a couple of really key parts. The first one is the body. This is the cell body of the neuron. It's going to be where the nucleus is contained and a lot of the cytoplasm of the cell. It's also going to have these dendrites, and dendrites are going to be attaching this cell to all the other neurons around it. So you can think of this as a central hub, and all of these are connections to neighboring neurons. We call this the soma. It's essentially that sort of cytoplasmic center to the cell. Uh, these are very stripped down cells. They don't have a lot of the, the sort of nuts and bolts that we see, bells and whistles that we see in the other eukaryotic cells. Um, but that's because their main job, their main function, is to simply receive and send signals. So concentration gradients are going to be their game, not so much all of the stuff that we've been talking about in terms of muscle function. So when we go past the cell body and the dendrite and the soma, we're going to get down here to the axon. And the axon is going to be the main thoroughfare of the cell. In other words, this is going to be the main part where the axon, or excuse me, where the signal is being fired. You can think of this like the wire, okay, or the cable that is going to span the distance between the receiver and the recipient. Okay, so in other words, if this is my computer, maybe this is the cable that goes down and plugs into the wall or something, I don't know. Or if it, it might plug it to another computer would be a better way to put it because this is linked to another accent over here. So we have accents all around here linked to the dendrite, and then we have accents all around here waiting to receive signals from the accent terminal. So this guy is supposed to receive signals from the surrounding accents and then take that signal and fire it to these accents over here, thus creating a bridge using this accent right here. The myelin sheath is an insulating sheath that's going to go over the axon and it's going to increase the speed of the signal that's sent along this line. We're going to talk about that a little bit later, but essentially the electrical impulse is caused by a concentration gradient um, between the outside and inside of the axon. And of course it's going to be a gradient of chemicals, but also of charge. So we're going to see a charge differential take place. And the myelin sheath helps to speed up that charge differential so that the message can travel quickly through the axon to reach the axon terminals. Once we're at the axon terminals, there is a slight space between the terminals and the other neurons. We call that the synaptic cleft. And it's going to activate neurotransmitters, which are sort of like signaling molecules at the end of the axon terminal, to fire and be accepted by other dendrite bodies uh, outside uh, over here. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about those membrane potentials. So you guys know that polarity means an uneven distribution of charge. It means that there's a positive and a negative, like a magnet, it's polar, right? Okay, but this polarity is going to be across the membrane of the neuron. In other words, there's going to be a concentration gradient wherein there's going to be a positive charge on one side of the membrane of the axon and a negative charge on the other. And this is what we call this polarity, and we call it membrane potential. In other words, it's the potential of the membrane to have an electrical charge because it has an uneven distribution of charge from one side to the next. A resting potential is going to be when the neuron is not actively firing or cut on. We say that this is around negative 70 millivolts. Okay, now it's a very small unit of voltage, uh, and this is when it's typically just not doing anything. It's maintained again by this uneven distribution. An action potential is where the fun stuff comes in. This is where we get a signal and we fire that signal down the axon to relay a message either to or from our brain. So this difference in charge becomes plus 30 millivolts. Okay, now it's interesting. You can see it goes from being negative 70 to plus 30. So there's a huge uh, change that occurs across the membrane potential. And we're going to take a look at more of the details, but essentially what's going to happen is that the negative charge and the positive charge are going to swap places. And when that happens, it's going to send an electrical signal down the membrane. When that happens and they swap places, it's not gonna, they're not going to swap places and it's not going to happen across the whole of the membrane at once. <laughs> 
excuse me, wow, allergies are just killing me right now. Um, it's going to happen in one spot, and then it's going to trickle down the axon all the way to the end. Uh, and so I want you to imagine this like a wave, an action potential. It starts in one place, and then it sort of flows down the axon. And you can see that positive and negative swapping place all the way down. So we call the chart the change from resting potential to the action depolarization because we are depolarizing the membrane. We are swapping those charges. And then repolarization is when we restore that membrane potential so that we're ready to go ahead and pass along another signal. If we don't do repolarization, then we're never going to be able to go back to depolarization. In other words, we have to build up a concentration gradient again so that it's ready to go ahead and flow back down and pass along an electrical signal. Remember that in your body, a lot of maintaining homeostasis isn't actually trying to support equilibrium, which is an equal distribution of, of things across the membrane. We actually want, oftentimes, for there to be concentration gradients and differences between one side of the membrane and the next. That's because those concentration gradients are basically going to be waiting. Uh, they're all set up for some sort of reaction to occur, and all it's going to take is a little input of energy to make that domino effect happen and to enact a change in our bodies. A resting potential is basically going to be uh, maintained by potassium and sodium pumps. Um, sodium potassium pumps are what we call anti-porters. Basically, their job is to pump sodium in, oh, excuse me, sodium out and potassium into the axon. Um, so basically, the sodium floats around the outside of the axon and the potassium is inside the cytoplasm. So here it says it expels three sodium ions for every two uh, potassium ions admitted. So potassium going in, sodium out. It does require ATP to perform, so this is not uh, this is a form of active transportation, not passive or facilitated. This creates an electrochemical gradient, inside negative, outside positive. Okay, so we can see here that there is no net polarity in this one right here when it's shut, and then when we go ahead and open it, there is a net polarity. So essentially, what happens is when the uh, sodium potassium pumps are inactive. We do not have a membrane potential, but when they are active, they maintain a membrane potential by uh, forcing there to be more sodium outside and more potassium inside. Obviously, this would be the natural state if we just let it go, but if we did that, we wouldn't have any kind of polarity built up between the membrane, and so we wouldn't be able to have this wonderful action potential. So let's take a look at what an action potential looks like. When we have depolarization, it's actually going to be triggered by the opening of sodium channels. Because we have a concentration gradient built up with more sodium outside and more potassium inside, as soon as we open that channel, all of that sodium is going to want to flow out of the cell. Okay. Now when that happens, we're going to end up getting that positive charge swapped to be on the inside of the cell relative to the outside of the cell. So here's how we started with positive outsides because the sodium was outside. Then when we went ahead and opened up the sodium channel, we let all that sodium flow naturally down its concentration gradient, and suddenly we have a much more positive inside and a much more negative outside. Repolarization is going to be after we sent that signal. So the signal's been sent. Essentially, that's this is the sending of the signal. It's been sent. It polarizes the membrane, and then we want to go ahead and reset it, so we repolarize. We open up potassium channels, which allows for potassium to go ahead and flow out, thus going ahead and changing uh, the membrane potential again. And then we go ahead and we, uh, we reactivate our sodium potassium pump uh, to restore the gradient that we want. And this is called the refractory period. It's the period of time that it takes for us to restore the proper gradient of molecules. Um, uh, and as long as our refractory period is happening, we can't fire the neuron again. Okay, so once again, resting, we receive a signal, depolarize, repolarize, and then refractory. We're ready to receive again. Ion channels in the axon are voltage gated. This means that they're only going to open when a signal is received. Okay, so this depolarization of the membrane isn't just going to happen. It's going to happen when there's a specific signal that's re uh, that is received during the axon's resting potential. Unless the signal is received, it won't depolarize and no signal will be sent. This makes it so that unless you're supposed to receive a signal in response to something like in a stimulus in the environment, your neurons just aren't automatically going to fire. This is so important. 
right? Because you don't want your neurons just randomly firing all the time. That wouldn't make any sense. And you would be reacting to things that you wouldn't be able to see happening. There wouldn't be environmental stimulus. It would be like you would suddenly jerk away because you felt like you were burning. And it was just because your neuron for your heat sensor started to fire, right? That wouldn't be a great thing. So to make sure that doesn't happen, we go ahead and voltage gate these channels. So the depolarization at one axon segment is going to then trigger the opening of the channels in the next and so on and so on. And this is that wave I was talking about. So this progresses through the axon in a wave of depolarization. You can see it here. Resting potential, depolarization, here comes the signal. The signal hits, it starts to move down the line. And as it moves, the areas that it leaves behind start to repolarize and eventually get back to resting state. So you can see this thing just shifts down and at the end, when, once it reaches the end, everything behind it should be back and resting and ready, excuse me, ready to go again. This also ensures that there's a one-way direction of flow of the charge. This is something else that I forgot to mention. Unless it was like this, we wouldn't be able to have a unidirectional flow. Because we have to repolarize and get back to resting behind the depolarization, we're not going to have the signal be able to travel in both directions. It's only going to be able to travel towards the resting potential. Okay, And because these guys are voltage gated and they are reliant upon only activating the segment adjacent to them, this makes it so that they can't go backwards along the axon. That's a good important thing because you, you only want to send your signals in one direction. That's way more efficient. And plus, um, oftentimes, you're trying to send a signal from your hand to your brain. You don't want that signal going both ways because then it's going to get very confusing, especially if that signal said jerk away. You know, it's going to, you're going to have weird conflicting results. So action potentials are going to propagate on something called an all or none rule. What does this mean? OK, so let me think about it this way. OK, say you're on a diet, OK, and your diet is can't eat chocolate chip cookies, but you really, really love chocolate chip cookies, okay? Like, they are, they are your entire life, and let's be real, they are. Okay, so you love chocolate chip cookies, and you go on this diet, maybe you give it up for Lent or something, and you go on this diet, and you're just like, you know, you're 12 days into the diet, you haven't touched a chocolate chip cookie, which for you is crazy, and you're sitting there just like white knuckling the sides of your chair, like, oh my god, I can't think about cookies, I can't think about chocolate chip cookies, and then you're like, one day you're like, well, okay, just just once, just I'm just gonna break it once, just once, it's fine. I'm only gonna eat one, just gonna eat one, maybe even a half of one. And then you eat an entire package of chocolate chip cookies. It's like, if you allow yourself to eat one, you can't control yourself. Okay, that's what I mean by all or none. Basically, when, when these accents reach a particular threshold, so basically the signal starts coming into the accent, um, it increases the accent, increases the accent. Once it reaches this right here, okay, so you saw that that turned orange suddenly, it was blue, and then it suddenly turned orange. Once the whole thing turned orange, the signal fires. If the whole thing doesn't turn orange, in other words, if the right amount of signal isn't received, if the signal isn't intense enough, the accent doesn't fire. However, the second that that signal is strong enough, the accent fires. There is no in-between. Just like with you and the cookies, there was no eating just half a cookie, you ate the whole pack. The same thing with the accent. As soon as that signal reaches the threshold, it has to fire. There is no choice for it to fire or not to fire. It must fire. So it always occurs at the same magnitude and the same electrical stimulus is generated, okay? This is to help to protect your system from having signals that are too powerful or too weak um, and to make sure that there is an even efficiency of signals all the way through your system. So this minimal electrical stimulus that has to be reached is about negative 55 millivolts. As soon as that reached, you are going to fire some sort of signal down your neuron. So action potentials can only be triggered when the accumulation of simulation from dendrites exceeds the threshold potential. This is another way of making your system efficient. If you didn't do this, your system might fire at times when it wasn't warranted. So we can trace this using something called an oscilloscope. The oscilloscope looks at time and then membrane potential over that time. So we can see here in our resting potential, we're at about negative 70 millivolts, which we should expect. We have our signal. Our signal reaches the threshold potential, and the second it does, we go ahead and we have the depolarization of the membrane, and we have the, um, the accent fire its signal. Once we get up to this point, the signal has been fired for this particular uh, you know, chunk of the axon. It's going to move on to the next chunk of the axon, which at this point is now undergoing the resting 
signal fire stage. Um, but for this particular chunk of the action, we've reached the end of that potential, and now we're going to start our repolarization. And we're actually going to dip down lower than the resting potential. Okay, and this is going to be that refractory period right here. Um, well, this, well, particularly this is the refractory period um, where we're, you know, repolarizing. But this right here, this uh, is going to be really important because this piece right here, where we're actually restoring that gradient using the sodium potassium pump. This is the time we have to wait um, until we're able to be able to fire again. Now we can't fire again from here either, but I'm just trying to say that during this refractory period, it's more like a resting period uh, in sort of restoring those potentials. But this right here is the really crucial point. Until we rise back up to negative 70 millivolts, we are unable to fire again. Okay, so it, you have to be pretty precise with this. You can't go um, up or down. And this little bit gives us that essential little break between them to make sure that we can get back up to 70, negative 70 millivolts and we're ready to fire again. So we have four key stages. The resting potential, that's the maintained by the sodium potassium pump, okay? Depolarization, so here we have that sodium ion comes into the axon. Repolarization, so we have the potassium ions are going to leave. And then we're gonna have that refractory where we're going to restore the resting potential using the sodium potassium pump. And then it's going to maintain that pump until we have another firing. Millineation, so let's go ahead and talk about um, the myelin sheath. The myelin sheath, I said, made signals travel faster. Basically, how they do this is that the myelinated sections, which you can see right, well, it's hard, but you can see um, on this section right here is where they are, and you can see it when that bar goes away. The myelinated sections are essentially going to be um, the sections that are covered in a non-polarizable substance. So in other words, um, the sections that you see that are covered in the blue cannot be polarized or depolarized. They are non-polar. Okay, and you might be wondering, you're like, oh, well, that seems to really suck. Well, no, it's really good because that means that only very small segments of the axon are going to be able to receive um, the polarization or depolarization. This means that the signal is going to jump between teeny sections of the axon rather than traveling all the way down the axon. If we had an unbroken wave start from the left side of the axon and traveling to the right, as you see on the top of those little animations, it would take forever for that signal to travel from start to finish. But if the signal is constantly jumping by basically uh, depolarizing the little piece of axon and then at the very end uh, releasing um, those chemicals, those uh, sodium and potassium, to travel across to the next little bit, we can actually hop, just sort of start hopping and skipping between these small sections across what we call these nodes of Ranvier. And this is going to drastically increase the speeds of our electrical transmission. We call this saltatory conduction. Again, essentially, we are just hopping from small little polarized sections rather than having to depolarize and repolarize the entirety of the axon. So this is where we get that white and gray matter. And you probably heard someone say, thank with your gray matter. So gray matter is going to actually be non-myelinated uh, neurons. And we call these uh, glial um, and, and uh, nutrient neurons. Basically, what we're having here is that these cells are going to be providing nutrients and support to the actual neurons that are going to be doing most of the thinking. Now, there is some sort of correlation between gray matter and intelligence, but most of the actual thinking neurons are not going to be gray matter. They're going to be white matter because these are going to be the ones that are myelinated. So there's going to be the ones with the high speed transmissions. These guys are going to be low speed transmissions, but they do provide a lot of metabolic support because remember, what is keeping the action resting potential of these neurons alive is the input of ATP energy to maintain that sodium potassium pump. Without it, we're not going to be able to have that neural activity. So myelination takes up significant space, which is why when you look at the brain, you'll see a lot of gray matter. White matter is going to be more near the core, and that's going to be the stuff that's going to be sending those very high speed signals all around your brain and from your peripheral nervous system to your central nervous system. Synapses. So when we talked before about the very end of the neuron, we have this, what I call the synaptic cleft. I'm going to show it to you here. Um, the synaptic cleft is going to be, wow, that was a long time ago, wasn't it? The synaptic cleft is going to be here. Basically, when the signal goes from the dendrites down the axon, it's going to end up here at the axon terminal. And there's a slight space between these and the dendrites of another axon. So you can imagine all these little squiggly things sort of connect with all these squiggly things on another axon that's over here. Okay, now, how does the signal actually travel from one uh, to the other? 
it's through synapses. So these small gaps are going to allow for certain chemicals to bridge the gaps and then decide how the signal is interpreted by the next neuron. So the signals, um, now the electrical signals are not actually transferred, so we actually have to use something called a neurotransmitter. So neurotransmitters are actually going to basically take the, uh, they're going to be the culmination of that signal that traveled down the axon, and they're going to go ahead and transmit the actual message. Um, when they bind to what's called dendritic receptors, which are just receptors on the dendrites, they are going to con uh, continue that nerve impulse, but different neurotransmitters have different sort of ways in which they, um, they make that impulse happen and sort of different strengths or flavors of those impulses. So here we have synaptic transfer. We have an action potential that's going to arrive at the axon terminal. So we've had the, um, the signal travel all the way down the axon. It ends up here at the terminal. We have voltage-gated calcium channels that are going to open up, and the calcium is going to enter the presynaptic neuron. Okay, so in this case, our calcium uh, is going to uh, be the uh, initiator here. Okay, so the vesicles are going to move to the membrane. They're going to dock. The neurotransmitter is released. And when the neurotransmitter is released, um, it was activated by the calcium, by the way. The calcium comes in, activates the neurotransmitter. Neurotransmitter is released. Neurotransmitters, by the way, can be hormones or, or any other signaling molecule. They're going to be released and bound to a dendritic receptor over here on the next axon. That dendritic receptor is going to be uh, received and interpreted to go ahead and figure out which kind of response should be initiated by the next axon. Neurotransmitters are going to open these gated ion channels to control the flow um, of ions into or out of the next axon. So it's going to contribute to the next um, action potential. These small changes are going to known as, be known as graded potentials. So these neurotransmitters are going to have to be received from that axon or from multiple axons, or we're going to have to receive enough neurotransmitters from a single axon in order to reach that threshold potential to fire. Remember, if they don't reach that threshold potential, they won't fire. So neurotransmitters can actually trigger that excitatory firing, or they could actually inhibit the next firing of the next neuron. So excitatory might open uh, calcium channels but inhibitory might uh, promote hyperpolarization. So they might actually use um, sodium or uh, chloride channels to actually combat uh, the next stage of polarization. The combined action of all of these are going to determine whether or not that threshold potential is released and the firing is going to occur. So excitatory potentials can combine and when they combine, we're going to get the actual threshold potential reached and we'll have the firing of the neuron. Inhibitory potentials will cancel out the excitatory signals and never reach that threshold, making sure that that neuron is not going to fire. Now this could happen if your body gets to the point where it's like, oh wait, no, that signal wasn't powerful enough or it wasn't strong enough, we don't actually need this. It's basically like, oh, no, never mind, false alarm, we don't need to continue the signal, everything's good. Okay, excitatory neuron potentials are when it receives a stimulus and says, okay, no, the stimulus is continuing and we need an action based off this. So this is another way for your body to specifically control its response to an external stimuli. There are many types of neurotransmitters, um, some that are in, involved in fight or flight, some that are involved in feeling pleasure, and some that are involved in your memory uh, and the ability to be able to um, retain information or even learn information. So there are tons of neurotransmitters, and you probably recognize some of these like dopamine and serotonin and adrenaline. Those are all pretty common. Um, you'll also see these in certain medications that are used to uh, fight things like depression. Acetylcholine is one with both in ex excitatory and inhibitory uh, actions. It is excitatory within what we call a neuromuscular junction. That's going to cause your muscles to contract. Um, this is used within heart medication as well. Uh, it's inhibitory, so it's going to cause your heart rate to slow. Um, now, the thing about acetylcholine and all neurotransmitters is that when they're received by the receptor, they also need to be broken down eventually. Otherwise, that receptor is going to continue to receive that signal and it's going to keep firing that neuron. This is why, uh, you know, certain drugs, you'll start to lose the effect of the drug um, or the perceived effect of the drug over time with your body because um, your body is going to require more and more of it in order to be able to have that initial response because you're going to kind of, um, you're, you're going to kind of get your body used to feeling that kind of response. So acetylcholine and, and other neurotransmitters are broken down by specific enzymes. Here's acetylcholines. Um, and it's going to make sure that that acetylcholine doesn't continuously fire, because as long as it fires, it's going to inhibit the rate of the heart. Now, sometimes you want that, but you don't always want that. 
So um, it's important to also make sure that the enzyme is taking care of it eventually and basically turning that signal off. The overstimulation can lead to convulsions and paralysis. So it's very important, especially with um, with medications that deal with neurotransmitters, to make sure that you also are um, not having the neurotransmitter continuously activate. Okay, and then we have neonicotinoids. Neonicotinoids uh, are able to bind to these receptors, um, and they actually cannot be broken down, uh, and they will cause permanent overstimulation. Um, so this is going to be um, a toxin for a lot of organisms, um, basically causing it so that they are unable to break it down and it will cause some permanent stimulation of their nervous system and eventually kind of burn out their nervous system. So we can use this as a toxin. So the overarching idea here is that you have these specialized cells that can conduct electric currents or um, you know polarization across the membrane. And those are going to relay signals from your central nervous system, which is your brain and your spinal cord, to your peripheral nervous system, and back again using both the afferent and efferent systems. Again, your neural system is just for to allow you to be able to evoke responses to the environment uh, and to be able to respond appropriately to maintain homeostasis to changing conditions. I hope you guys have enjoyed this, uh, this topic. Um, we're going to take a look at this in a little bit more detail this week. Next week, we're going to clear up homeostasis. And then, guys, we are on the home stretch. So hope you enjoy. Take care. I uh, can't wait to see you in the next lesson.